What's up, my friends? Right now, this is a moment that I am so fucking stoked to be having right here. Um, here I am with Steve Shubin. Uh, and when we first started to know each other, I was hanging out on your shoulders and we were walking through some fruit orchards and you were telling me stories about little badass ninja turtle heroes before they were even ninja turtles. <laughs> Yes, I yes I was a little a characters by the name of Iggy and Diggy, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we had some, we had some great stories. That, but then you were only about thirty pounds, and you're easier to carry. <laughs> so. We we still do that every once in a while. <laughs> right. I hop on your shoulders. We walk through fruit <laughs> orchards. We talk yeah. about stuff. Um, but you know, so we've grown up. You know, I've grown up, and you've been you know a second father to me my whole life. Right, and um, you know, really provided this incredible perspective of you know this differing world of where you came from really interesting and now here at the end um just within the last month two really important parts of our worlds just coincided in a really kind of beautiful and awesome way when you went down to peru and um, took the chance and took the courageous leap to go and do the ayahuasca and wachuma journey with with don howard so it's been this crazy kind of journey where we've started off and and gone our ways and had our had our relationship and now have crossed over in this kind of really cool way and it's awesome to be sitting here with you but i want everybody here to know the full story of the amazing kind of life and journey that you live which you know started much different than you know even our times and and what happens then and journey through your police work and the SWAT team so you know, take us through kind of, you know, your life um, as it started and, and before even even meeting me. All right. Well, you know, my, my life, as I look at it and think back, is it's been really interesting. You know, um, I grew up in the blue collar days where corporal punishment, um, it wasn't an issue. It's what was given to you when you were out of line. Even if you're at school, the principal would paddle your butt. You know? And if you so, don't know what corporal punishment means, it means when someone's smacking your ass. Yeah. All right? Because we, we might not even know what that means. Exactly. <laughs> and, and no parent ever ever went back into the principal to find out why he touched their kid. They were usually beating you all the way back to school. So <laughs> those were the days where we know when you, when you fucked up, you were given to. I mean, I've been to my friend's house and messed up, and their parents would spank you. Can you imagine that now? That yeah. could never happen now. No, no, no not at all. They'd <laughs> imagine, be put in jail. Yeah, imagine someone's parents beating <clears throat> your kid. Oh, yeah, they whipped me with a belt. Yeah. What the fuck? <laughs> no, I was in, like, when I was a kid, I grew up in a Hispanic area in, in East L.A., and I was over my, my buddy's house across the street, and I took one extra burrito, and I felt that her, the, his mother's um, hand on my ass really hard. She almost <laughs> dropped me. This is a tough woman. And believe me, I put that burrito back up there right away. But you know, but th- they were. It was a good time. It was a good time to be re- to to grow up as a kid. Times were different than now. The the problems kids have now. I mean, I don't know how parents deal with this crap. You know, but my life was good. Um, my mom, my dad, were they incredible parents? Nah, they weren't. My mom had eight kids of her own uh, from I think three different marriages. Uh, then when she met. Um, Shubin, Harry Shubin, he ha- already had six kids. So there was like 14 kids in one house. It's a litter. That was, oh, yeah. And, you know, when you put two families together, you're going to fight. That's where I learned how to fight, my own brothers and sisters, you know. And we used to laugh because the person that got up last, not only did they not get breakfast, they didn't get underwear. Because, you know, there was only like, it, it seemed like there was like 12 <laughs> pairs of underwear in this family of 14 kids. So uh, I learned how to get up really early. That's why I was a chubby little kid, and I always had underwear on. They weren't great underwear, but they were on. Yeah. So yeah, I, you know, life was good. And in, in uh, I was born in Compton, California, and and uh, life was good in Southern California. But most of the kids in the neighborhood I was in were all a bunch of poor kids. We didn't have anything. You know, all of us we invented skateboards with, you know, two by fours and taking the old metal skates and cutting them in half and nailing them onto the board and. And if you wanted to play guns, which was popular then, it wasn't like this politically incorrect thing. Um, you cut them out of wood, you drew a little trigger on them, and you chase each other, and, and you yelled, bang, bang, I got you. <laughs> totally different times, but it's, you know, life was good. Um, uh, getting to high school, my parents weren't athletes, so by the time I got to high school, I'd never played football, and I don't think I really watched it. 
You were busy. You were busy out working. I mean, yeah. some of your stories from when you were eight, nine years old, you were making your own money. You were yeah. making your way. You know, just yeah. kind of almost on your own. Yeah, back when I was a kid, you know, it, it was it was a safe environment. At least it seemed like it was for me. And you know, when I was when I was six years old, I was sweeping hair at the barber shop and stocking shelves at the liquor store. A little, you know, little dirty foot, you know, chubby little kid. I was doing everything I could. I. You know, I was raking leaves, and and see back then when you did favors, when you did jobs for people like raking their, their leaves or cutting their lawns, they paid you in Coke bottles, soda bottles, because there was a redemption value, and they didn't want to deal with it. And what I loved is doing jobs for the big Seven Up bottles because they were five cents. The smaller ones were three cents, and those really sucked, you know. <laughs> so yeah, you worked for soda bottles, so you took them down, you redeemed them, and and since we were. I had so many brothers that would take my money if I didn't hide it very well. I would go straight down to Tasty Freeze, which we loved as a kid, and I would eat what I earned that day, and I'd go home broke but full, you know? <laughs> so that's that's the life we lived as kids. Uh, but they were great times, you know? If, you, if you're running down to the park to play, there were all kinds of fruit trees hanging over fences, and you could eat along the way, and life was different than it is now. Right. Uh, by the time I got to high school, uh, my parents didn't pl- ever play any sports. They were of no, in- plus they had so damn many kids. I mean. I don't know if they cared. Uh, there's just so many of them. You're just trying to, like kids are like juggling. You, and when a ball's falling, you're trying to lift it back up, you know. So uh, I got to high school, and since I was a big kid, I think when I got to my freshman year, I was I was 6'2", 215, and based on... After as a freshman. Yeah, as a freshman. And, and they s- said, you're playing football, son. Yeah, they said, you're <laughs> playing football, and you have to play on the varsity team. And I'm like, yeah, right on, you know. I think I'm a tough guy, right? And uh, so I remember putting, the day I went to, to showed up at the locker room, got my physical, and, they, and then my mom, who was a real dominant broad, big broad, she, she took me down to, to practice because it was before school had actually started. And so she takes me over to the gym, and she had been talking to the coach on the phone. So she's determined to take me in the gym. And this is my first day. And so she goes walking into the locker room with me. All the football players in the varsity team are standing around putting on the jock straps and shoulder pads and you name it. And here comes my mom, right, leading me. I'm like the little bitch walking behind my mom, right? <clears throat> so some some guy yells out, hey, lady, get the hell out of here, something like that. And my mom turns around. She says, all right, don't worry, Sonny. You haven't got anything I've never seen before. And I shrunk. I mean, I, I was like, oh, my God. So by and the kids time, don't want to even get dropped off at the oh, no. movies. My by mom their wouldn't parents. even let me. Get, my mom wouldn't drop me off. No, she had to walk in, right? Which took me about a month to recover from, by the way. So they give me my pads. I didn't know how to put jock straps on. I didn't know where pads went. I finally got them on. Ran out to practice. You were was, still sharing underwear with your brothers. Yeah, you don't know what a jock was, strap is. I was like, have this? underwear. <laughs> And I, you know, this, jock is missing, strap. this this underwear is missing the ass. Yeah. There's I something was used, wrong with it. I was used to underwear with holes in it, but not completely <laughs> gone in the ass. So so uh, so I get my stuff on. I run out to the practice field. And I, I I run up to the coach, and I don't know what offense and defense is. I've never really even watched football. I was just big, and so the coach says to me, he says, uh, "Son, what position do you play?" And I just looked to see, and they were broken up into their different groups. I looked to see who was having the easiest practice. <laughs> so now all the linebackers were talking with the linebacker coach. So I pointed over there. I said, right over here, coach. I'm right here. So he sends me over to the linebackers. And they used me for a blocking dummy all <laughs> practice. And when I went home that night, I had to sleep on the floor because my tailbone was broken. I mean, they just beat me and beat Whoa. me and beat me uh, while I was trying to. F- and so when I got home, I'm said, I said to my mom, you have got to let me quit. I can't do this game. This is terrible. She wouldn't let me quit because she had spent $16 on my physical. She says, you give me $16 and you can quit. Didn't have 16 bucks, right? That was a lot of money though. So I was stuck in football. And so I did fine that year. I went from there and I wrestled. And I was actually better at wrestling, but I was the heavyweight. And, that's, and wrestling for me was much harder as a sport, you know. Uh, but that's where I, w- I did my best, and I did really well through, you know, all through high school and stuff. But what I learned from all that is how to be part of a team, which is an incredible thing to learn, mm-hmm. and and how to fight when you got no fight left in you, and what it takes to to conquer your own. Um, you know, I wouldn't call it cowardice, but you know, when fatigue makes a coward out of anybody, I don't care what you're saying, and not the yeah. ugly side of cowardice. You know, it makes us all give in. It makes us just say, you know, what the hell? Are we, what am I doing? Well, and the pain, the pain of defeat and the pain of the blows that are raining down mm-hmm. and you're getting pinned seems mm-hmm. less than just the effort that required. So it does. It makes you trade something that you don't want, that's yeah. detrimental, 
for something that makes you, you feel a little more comfortable. Right, you know? and quitting doesn't seem so bad when you're yeah. feeling all that, right? Yeah, yeah, it seems yeah. like, no, this is, the th- this is the thing to do. Yeah. Well, I couldn't sell that to my mom, so I <laughs> had to stay. In. She wouldn't let me out of football. Sure. And, and as it turned out, it was good for me to stay in a, in a, in a, in a sport, and then, into, and then I even went out for track. I tried out for baseball, but I kept hitting the first baseman when I'd run around, <laughs> and you're not supposed to run in the base. Yeah. And I was so used to hitting people, it just didn't seem right that a guy could throw a little ball and you would be out. I mean, he should at least have to pay something, right? So I hit him all the time, and I got thrown off the team after like one week. Fair so enough. That wasn't, I didn't, that yeah, wasn't meant for yeah, you. Anyway. Look, baseball's a great sport. I wasn't cut out for it. I just can't imagine standing around, scratching your eggs, <laughs> and waiting for somebody to hit something so you could chase uh, yeah. it. That I wasn't you. my sport. It's a great People sport. People had a lot of time back yeah, at a certain yeah. point in time. Yeah, so uh, sports were good. It worked good for me in high school. I don't know what I would have done without them. It was a great time. Yeah, I mean, it's such a so valuable as a microcosm for life. Mm-hmm. But then that carried you all the way into college as well. Like, yeah, what did, what after that, you know, coming, it was a big deal then to go. It was during Vietnam and all that. I decided to go go into the Air Force because I didn't want to be drafted because the draft was on, and I was a fairly smart guy, so I tested high enough to get into the Air Force. Not that you're dumb to go into anything less but i i wanted to go into a certain area which is really only just military police which mm-hmm. i don't know how smart you have to be for that <laughs> so anyway i went into the air force uh, two weeks after i got out of high school and i was gone never had flown on an airplane or anything I never left southern california uh so i did that i went to um i was given orders to go to saigon um but then i got picked up out of uh, a general saw me and uh, they had teams over in, in the football teams over the, in uh, Germany. So he saw me and changed my orders and sent me to Germany so I didn't have to go to uh, See, that's, 16, to that's $16 might have saved your I, fucking did, life. Exactly. Because <laughs> I had a lot of friends that unfortunately got hurt and killed and stuff over there. And sure. that's one thing I didn't want to do. Although I believe in our country, I did not. I wasn't excited about going there even though yeah. I was on my way. Uh, the military, I went to Germany for a couple of years. Uh, I got to play football both years. Uh, and it was probably junior le- junior college level football. It wasn't full college level. Uh, it was a good time, um, and it taught me a lot. You know, the military taught me a lot. You know, oftentimes I think that everybody should go into the military for two years, uh, like the Israelis, right high school, like the Israelis do. I think I think discipline and and learning how to um, to be broke. You know, you got to be broken down sometimes to figure out where the hell you are. And the military is good, good doing that. So if only the military was a little bit more conscious in what they actually did with you, mm-hmm. you know, that would make a lot of sense. You know, it's yeah, like, yeah. it's like subjecting yourself. Yeah. Maybe the things you get out of it are good, but you're being used as a pawn in a fucking crazy game. Yeah. It's, it's, it's harder than hell to see. They truly believe your government issued property and you yeah. don't belong to yourself. And, and I never got along very well with that concept. So I wasn't, I wasn't the best soldier. I couldn't wait to get out. Since I was playing football in Germany, um, UCLA on a big um, um, recruiting tour, um, there was a coach, a lineman, line coach there called Coach Long. He got me out of the military about six months early to go play football, give me a scholarship at UCLA. Uh, but they wanted me to go to junior college, which I did. But then I picked up a scholarship to Nevada, Reno. Mm-hmm. Um, but by then, I was one of my foolish mistakes uh, in life was getting married at 19 years old. Uh, and then becoming a father at 21, although that was great. You know, my son, um, Stephen, who you know very well, mm-hmm. um, I was 21 when he was born. So I had to, I stopped college in, in my, at the end of my junior year and uh, went to the police, you know, just went to a, an academy um, and got into the police department so I could start making some money. And that's when, you know, so when, when, w- I was younger. The stories of your police days would just have me and anybody present, all the kids, yeah. just fucking enraptured. Because this wasn't like traffic tickets, police <clears throat> work. And you, know, you made it eventually into the SWAT team. Yeah. And, and, I mean, those were different times and yeah. different kind of a code of rules as yeah, far as it was as a different time. <clears throat> police work was, and, I, and still to this day, I think it's a great career. Um, it, it was never a dull day. I never wanted a day off. And even when I got paid, I was like, I couldn't believe I was getting paid for having so much fun. You know, I've been in hundreds of fights, um, but I can tell you, I've, I've never felt, I never felt good after a fight. Yeah. You know, when you have to knock somebody unconscious or choke them out uh, or kill them. I mean, I've never, I've never enjoyed any part of that sure. because I'm a pretty compassionate person, but it's part of what you do. Uh, the most interesting thing about that was learning how to control your adrenaline. When things happen in a split second or you drive right in the middle of a robbery, 
your adrenaline will take off on you and it'll make your legs shake. And it's hard to run when your legs are shaking. Mm -hmm. But it's a physiological thing that you have to, you have to learn how to deal with so it doesn't mess up your ability to, to do your job. Yeah, that adrenaline factor is such a crazy factor because I remember I've only been in that one really major street fight. Mm -hmm. And <coughs> with, all the, with all the alcohol I've consumed, I've never blacked out where I couldn't remember anything. It's just not the way my brain works, right? But for that fight, I have like two brief memories. It's not because I got hit in the head. It's because my adrenaline spiked so fucking high that I don't even remember what happened. I ended up on my feet looking around the street saying, where did they go? Yeah. And like, I still to this day, I don't understand how I don't remember. I remember like snippets, like one guy threw a kick at me and I was like, what the fuck? So I kicked him back. Yeah. And like, I me but that's it. Like, you know, I was standing up like, what the hell? Yeah. And you know, had that have been videoed and you saw it today, yeah. you would say, oh my God, I had no fucking idea the fight <laughs> happened like that. No, absolutely not. The <clears throat> valet would try to tell me stuff like, oh man, that was awesome. I was like, was it? Yeah. Because I don't remember shit. <clears throat> I experienced that a lot in police work, you know. Uh, in my mind, I you know I did scenarios in my mind day day in day out. That's all I did on my way to and from work. And while I was on work, you're thinking, you know, if I walked in that store and this guy's doing this, here's what I'm going to do. Surprisingly enough, when when shit hits the fan, you'll do what you what your mind has learned to do. Then af after the dust settles, you're going like, oh sh Jesus Christ, I was a real star in that one. <laughs> had no idea what happened. Yeah. Because what happens too with the, with adrenaline, we get so far removed from our biology, from our ability to be. The, the you know the it's like the primitive people that we that we really truly are we don't use our senses our sight our smell our taste you know you don't become aware because we're so civilized and domesticated so when you get into this fight and your biology takes over your domesticated side is going holy shit what did i just do and so that's the, that's an interesting part about competition learning how to corral that learning how to 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 gain control of it let it out when you need to let it out and then you got to go home and be civil. You know, I would be on the SWAT team, and I'd go home after chasing bad guys. And our SWAT team was actually a major crime task force as well. Your job was to, to go to all in-progress felonies. That's all you did all night long. You carried all of your, your SWAT team stuff in the trunk in case there was a barricaded person. But other than that, you just went from one hot call to the next. And it was great because you'd get there, and, it, and you would... You know, you'd stop the crime, you'd tie everybody up, get them on the ground, and then the regular troops would come in, you'd give them the investigation, you'd jump in your car, and you'd go yeah. off to the next thing. Handle the paperwork, boys. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> it was like, how can life be better than this? <laughs> I mean, it, honestly, it was just an amazing time. Yeah. But, you know, seven years into it, and I was on the SWAT team for most of that time, uh, I'm a really compassionate person, you know, yeah. um, and I'm a big guy. So you end up using your body as this impenetrable looking shield of don't fuck with me. And you have to learn how to, you have to look mean when people look at you like, oh my God, stay away from that guy. Craziest thing. I was always the biggest guy. And if somebody was going to fight the cops, guess who they went after? <laughs> me. I would show up like 15 minutes after the shit hit the fan. And I'm the big guy that steps out and, the, and everybody take the, they would assault me. I'm like, fuck, I just showed up, why are they getting me, you know? But, you know, it's, I guess if you're going to get your ass whipped and go to jail, you want to get it the hard way, you know? I could never figure out what happened. It was a good time. Though. Like moths to a flame. It was a great, it was a great profession. Yeah. I, you know, so you're someone that's, you know, you believe in what you've experienced. Right. And, and that's, that's always been your kind of modality. Is this, can I, have I, has this affected me? What do I know? I know what I've sensed. I know what I've gone through. And, but there has been some experiences that you've had. I remember one story you had told me in police work that involved this kind of, you know, something that's a non-traditional sensory uh, explanation. Like I remember you were telling me one time you were, you should have gone down this alley to chase somebody, but you had this weird gut instinct that you shouldn't go down the alley. I don't know if I'm telling the story. Yeah. Right. Because, and it turned out there was an ambush that was going to be there, and you probably would have got killed there. Yeah, I, I, I learned, I don't know why I paid attention to what I used to think was my fear. I thought it was just me being afraid when it was really my, my, my natural instincts telling me not to do something. And so I was chasing a couple guys down an alley, and I knew right away, I mean, I got this, like this tingling sensation all over my head and my back and my hair stood up, and it was this sudden cold sweat that just hit me in an instant. And I had to back off and pull out of the, and, and I got away from the alley. 
and then we called in uh, a bunch of guys. We and we once we got into it and barricaded this and sealed off the alley and went into it. They had set up in three different places to shoot me, and I'm like, holy shit! And it's and everybody's saying like, dude, they had you cornered and they were gonna get you, mm-hmm. and I'm walking around like I'm the hero, you know, <laughs> trying to look like I'm cool the whole time. I'm thinking, holy shit, they almost got me. And it's a scary situation because, yeah. you know, the interesting thing about being a cop, they see a cop in uniform and you think this cop thinks like cops do and all this stuff. It's just a guy wearing a uniform with a gun who has the same level of fear that we all do. You learn how to control a little bit more. But honestly, you can be on a scene with eight cops and it's crazy or fighting or shooting or whatever. You got just eight guys that don't know, that want to go home to their family, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're all going to say they're badasses and they got it going on. Oh, yeah, this is cool. No problem. I didn't even spill my coffee on this one, you know? Because <laughs> we used to have this thing. You know, it was if you went into pursuit and chase somebody, it was like only rookies spilled their coffee or threw it out the window. <laughs> you were a star if you could chase somebody with a, with a cup of coffee and get out and arrest them and never spill a drink. <laughs> and then when they're on the ground handcuffed, you keep drinking your coffee. Now, that was a hero, right? craziness but that was you know that's what people aspired to be the big chaser that could keep his coffee in his hand so but it was a great it was you know paying attention to your senses has carried me through to this day yeah so so that if there's not really a good explanation for why you stopped it's not like you smelled somebody or you saw somebody or you heard somebody but there was some some other kind of field of perception you know and and i think you know kind of the the point that i'm making is that even though you had no belief system, you've just kind of, if something came up that you saw, you would trust it, you know? Yeah, I, I learned, I never, since I didn't, um, I didn't have a lot of guidance, parental guidance, and I had to kind of develop my own, um, my own belief system. And what I learned to do is listen to myself when I didn't know why. When I was so, so consumed with, oh my God, this is wrong, I shouldn't be doing this, I should get out of here, I learned to listen to that because there was not a lot of logic at times. Like if you're chasing some guy and you can see him in front of you running, why why do you stop? Why did you circle around and go down the other side? So I learned to pay attention to that. And oftentimes I don't know why because I didn't get ambushed. But so, uh, I did a couple times get ambushed by being too aggressive. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like you're always going to get the bad guy, even if you have to issue a warrant for him. So I learned you chase him until – and is and you keep the public as safe as possible. But when you get so locked into, you gotta get that guy that you don't understand what's going, or you don't pay attention to your senses, that's when you get in trouble. Yeah. yeah. So then, at some point, fast forward to about you know six weeks ago, mm-hmm. I come into the living room and I'm just kind of telling the story about my experiences down in the jungle doing the Wachuma. And out of the blue, you say, we gotta go. We gotta go. Yeah. <laughs> what, what about it at that moment? Because I'd been talking about this, you know, seemingly crazy stuff for for a while then but there's something there that happened at that moment where you're like fuck it i'm in yeah you know i've i've um i've I've done well in life because i've just worked my ass off and you know i've uh but there's certain things i watch you know and and certain people i watch and i know you've been on this like this mad terror to figure shit out in life Mm -hmm. and so I'm like, you know, I'm going to let Aubrey carry that torch for a while. When he when he nails the good stuff and he finds out where the good things are, then I'll go. That's very wise. It's like, it's like you're very the wise. scout that we send out in front, you know, to make sure there's a, yeah. what, what our battles are, you, you know. You can totally skip over Iboga. <laughs> exactly. And combo the frog medicine. There you, go. you can skip I'm out. not drinking anybody's <laughs> piss. I'm not doing any of that kind of, no gun, no gun powder. No, I'm not doing any of that shit. Yeah, yet. good, good. That's, <laughs> a, that's a wise decision. Yeah. So when you came in the house and you were talking about your experience, I'm going like, we're going to that. Kathy looked at me, you know, you know your mom, she yeah. looks at me, she goes like, are you on crack? <laughs> it's you. And she's like, you, sign something. I don't believe you're doing this. Because I don't, I don't believe in, in many things, right? Mm-hmm. But I know you had done, I could tell in, in, the, in the passion you had for the story, I could tell you had landed on something. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, uh, it's like, the scout went out and found out some truth. I'm not going to, I don't need to scout this thing out. I get it. Right. Yeah. Um, and really, um, I've, I've gotten to a stage with, uh, with, with Kathy and my wife, your mother, uh, who incidentally is probably the finest person I've ever known. I'd agree with that. Yeah. So I, I've been, I got to a point where, you know, you want to know more in life. You want to, it's, it's one thing to be look. I've been broke. Um, I've been have great careers like in police work and stuff and I'm done I've, I've done really well mm-hmm. but you know you you always want to be a better person I don't care if you have no money or a lot of money you want to 
the objective in my life is to be a better person every single year. Yeah. You know, the year I stop, that I retire and quit growing as a person, it's probably the year I'm going to die. But I have no intentions of stopping growing, right? Sure. So <clears throat> when the opportunity to go came up and, and uh, Kathy's been going to so many of these different things with you know, that, that are a lot of great people, a lot of, you know, not just psychics, but spiritual people that really understand, you know, things at a much higher level. Um, I pay close attention to that. And, I, and I've witnessed some things in these people that with my own eyes that I'm going like, okay, that isn't traditional. And yeah. people don't believe that, but I just watch that. And that yeah. was real, right? Yeah. So, so I'm like, I'm always on the sidelines uh, and I'm the kind of guy where I'm, I'm going to put myself in the game. I don't wait for the coach to call me. When I see my opportunity, I'm going, right? Yeah. And this one came up when, when you had told me all about it. I said, okay, we're going to that. And I said, and we're going to do the back-to-back. We're going to do ayahuasca and Wachuma 16 days because I'm not going back. They got me once. <laughs> yeah. If it doesn't work, I'm never going yeah. back there, so give, let's do this. You're going to give it a full try. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So we set that up, and, and uh, yeah, we did that uh, last month. Yeah, yeah. So you get down there, you get down to the jungle, it's hot, there's bugs. It's not exactly your ideal situation to begin no. with. No, you know me, I'm, I'm, I've, I'm, I've gotten spoiled, right? Yeah. You know, so I have a lot, uh, so I get to do a lot. Uh, but I'm, I'm, really, I'm really very clear on who I am. I'm just me, that's all I am. I'm nobody special, right? So, so we go down there, and, and now I was supposed to go down right away with Kathy, but um, something happened in my company. I had to handle some, some really important changes in the company, so I couldn't leave with Kathy. And so now the whole, the whole you're supposed to be follow a, a, a diet, a regimen when you go down and really prepare your body, prepare your mind. And you, they have a, a schedule where when you arrive, you've done all this protocol and you're ready. Well, since I couldn't go with Kathy and I called that off, she was down there on a Sunday. It started Monday. Wednesday, she calls me on the phone. Actually, Thursday, and I'm at Fogo de Chao, the big Brazilian meat fest place, right? And I'm packing it down. I'm on the phone, um, and she says, Steve, you have got to get down here. You have got to get down here. Please come down here. I said, what is Is it that good? She goes, no, it's not fun, but you've got to come down here. This is work. She says, this is work, yeah. but you have got to get here. And my wife's very, you know, um, she talked me into it. She basically bribed me into it. So I'm like, all right, all right. I'll go down. I'll go down. I'll make some quick arrangements. And I did. I got off the phone, arranged some flights and stuff like that. For the next day, the next morning, I was on the, the, the jet headed for Peru. Arrived there that night, checked into hotel. The following morning, um, I'm on a, a, another small jet going to Iquitos, Peru, which is, at best, a really shitty place. <laughs> You know, it's like yep. this war-torn, I'm, it looked like Saigon way back when, right? Yeah. Uh, and it was an ugly place. Someone told me they referred, referred to us as carne fresca, like we were fresh meat. Because you step out as a tourist and you're going to get plundered, man. I mean, this place is like, this place is crawling. Yeah. So we go through all that. I'm late. There's six, 15 people. I'm number 16 at this. So that I get on this little narrow, the, the boat is about as wide as my ass, and unfortunately <laughs> I have a wide ass. So you get on the boat and they're really long, so you get on the Amazon and you're tooling down there and I'm just thinking like, what in the hell did I get myself into, right? They go down these canals and it was shocking how well this guy knew all these canals. There's like no street signs, you yeah. gotta know what the hell you're doing. Dipping between this Yeah, it's crazy, and, right? Yeah. <clears throat> so um, it's getting on in the evening at about four o'clock and the boat gets there, and I go running up the stairs and onto this place. And for the listeners, I mean, this is like the Amazon goes up and down, and it's water level. Everything is built up on stilts. The walkways, all the connections, everything is elevated. And um, none of the stairs are cut the same height. You can go up a 5-inch stair, and the next one 15 inches, and then one's 20 inches, and then one's 2. I mean, it's... Depending on the size of the wood they have. No, That's just the whatever size fit is what they built it with, right? <laughs> so... Um, so I get there, go running up to the meeting, and before every ayahuasca meeting, one of the interesting things that I found out, there's a lot of tradition and ceremony in this. A lot of preparation goes into it, and it's critically important, as I came to, to understand. So I go running up to the circle, and they were all talking about the experiences that they were hoping to get to. Whatever their intentions were that evening, they got their opportunity to speak about it. And they passed this talking stick. So when I get there, I hadn't seen Kathy for about five days, and so I sit down next to her. It's the only open seat, and they had waited for me. And, and um, so I'm in this group, and they're, then they pass the stick to me. Howard, Don Howard says, okay, Steve, you're not getting away with just being silent. The stick's now yours. And I just said, hey, I'm the rookie. 
I don't want to interfere with anybody's deal. I'm just, you know, I'm just here to have, uh, my intentions are is to completely let go, to surrender. I'm going to get, ayahuasca is going to take me wherever it's going to take me. And that was about all I said. And so then everybody kind of retires to their sleeping Now, did you quarters. really, that's the right thing to say, right? Mm-hmm. But is, is that, I mean, did you really come to that? Because that, that's not something that's easy for you already, is no. just to surrender, you know? No, and see, I've come to this point in the past, you know, few months in my life before this. I'm like, I want to grow. Yeah. I don't want to be the, I don't want to be a, a control freak. I don't want to be heavy. I, you know, there was a time in my life when that served me well, but I've gotten to a point in life where it doesn't serve me well anymore. It actually hinders my own growth. It hinders my my kid, my children's growth. And, and, and you know, I've always had this thing with, um, there's an old there's a saying, maybe not, not many people have heard it, but there's a saying that a man's not a man until his, his father dies. That's total horseshit. But it is what people believe. Why can't my sons be men in my eyes? And so I had a real issue with understanding why why things why I would make things the way they were. Mm-hmm. So when I went down there, I knew I was truly surrendering. Whatever was going to happen was going to happen. I wasn't blocking a thing, and that was so my. So it's really the perfect time for you to come, you know. And there's an old wisdom that you come when the medicine calls you. I mean, yeah. for you to be in that state of mind while you're there mm-hmm. is is perfect, and yeah. it's taken a large part of a lifetime to get to that state of mind. Yeah. And many people fuck never get there, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and I've, you know, I mean, I've had a good life, but I've been around the block so many times, sometimes I think I own it, you know. Uh, I've done things great, I've done things wrong, but my wisdom comes typically from doing things wrong, but being committed to learning how to do things right. So I grow and grow, and oftentimes not the way I want to, and one of my commitments going to this is figure out what my wrong is, you know, because I'm, I'm 61 years old. Do I want to be um, 91? Yes, I do. How am I going to get there? A lot of that is learning how to live a better life between your ears. Mm -hmm. And so when I was ready, I mean, I was truly, I am ready to do this deal, you know? So, so then the cup gets passed around to you later that night. The interesting thing is, so, you know, you, you retire to your, to your area, everything's, it's very ceremonial, which I found out is critical to doing these things. Um, there's, is, so we get in this big round room, which I think that I recall, it's like the Maloka, this Mm -hmm. ceremonial room. And you're standing around in the, like a horseshoe. There were 16 of us. I was on the, I'm number 16 in this thing. And so there's candles lit. There's this great ceremonial table. There's tapestries. And there's this, um, uh, there's just a lot of great things on the table. And everybody's smoking these big wachuma. Mapacho. Mapacho, yeah. yeah, yeah. Mapacho, the big black. Um, and so I don't smoke, but I'm thinking like, yeah, I can Jungle get tobacco. into this. You yeah. Throw me one of those babies. I'll let it up, you know. <laughs> and so, um, the ceremony was great. It starts at eight o'clock, and the first person to be called up for the ayahuasca, and this is just a bowl, like the size of you know a cereal bowl, and there's a lot of ceremony. You step up to the front of this, which is kind of like an altar, and you stand there. You put your hands on the table, uh, and you and you're meditating. Basically, you're thinking hard on what you want to get to, and, and you know this. So, yeah. so then um, you I'm know getting the, nauseous already. Don Howard, it, yeah. okay. Don <laughs> yeah, Howard's continue. got his little things. He's shaking yeah, away. It's the, kind of rattles. And yeah, he's got the rattles and, smoke, and feathers, yeah. and and yeah, which which I honestly came to understand is a critical part of this. Sure. You know, so then you you drink the stuff, and it is nasty. Yeah, nasty, really. Fire I, mud. I drink I, I drank some nasty stuff in my life. This <laughs> this shit was nasty. Right? Yeah, but I got it down. You know, you put the cup back down, cool. then you retire to your seat. Right. So I'm number 16. Everybody now has had their ayahuasca. But the whole process takes about five minutes <clears throat> from the time he calls you up yeah. to when you sit back down. So obviously 16 times five. So by the time I get mine, this per- the first person is ready to blow up, right? What I didn't really understand is everybody vomits, right? Yeah. And you can have diarrhea too. It's, you know, And you purge, as, right? As you, might you have yeah. <laughs> Which I'll get to. Yeah, I will get to. <laughs> So, uh, so um, I'm sitting there, and it's all the candles are starting to burn out, right? And so the first person that took theirs was this girl. Um, all of a sudden, she just blow, just yeah. I mean, she <laughs> act like an impressive uh, purge, right? And everybody's given this huge Jethro bowl to puke in, you know. And she, about six or seven times, she just yelled into this bowl, and I was going, man. That was fucking wicked. <laughs> and then the next guy went, it sounded like, he sounded like a lion, like it was after somebody. Right? He went, yeah. And I was like, holy shit, it was kind of scary, you know? Yeah. And so I'm thinking like, and I'm getting kind of nervous. It's, it's getting to my time, you know? 
and uh, and and already from drinking, I'm feeling pretty nauseous. You feel kind of mm -hmm. you know pretty unsettled. Uh, but again, you're trying to focus on your intention and stuff like that. And my mind's thinking, God, are you sure you should be here drinking this shit? You know, so you're, you have to refocus and all that. So finally, everybody has vomited but me. And, and out of respect for everybody, it's really a silent time. Nobody is, you know, being vocal or anything. And so this is now 11 o'clock. We started at 8. And I'm sitting there impatient, like, going, oh, man, this is like, come on, Steve. Don't be a pussy. You're supposed to puke, you know? And so I'm waiting and waiting. No puke. Nothing's coming. But all of a sudden, I feel, feel my stomach go, Eww. I'm going, oh, no. I have to get to the bathroom in a hurry, right? Because you don't want to vomit and have diarrhea at the so same time. That's have, ugly. Do you have anything going on else in your mind? Yeah. Any visions or any? I was starting to see snakes. Uh -huh. The room was moving a little bit. You know, I was having some, I was seeing things. Everything I would think of was like in, uh, this three-dimensional, and it was really um, animated. Uh -huh. A lot of characters involved and stuff like that. And I was starting to see things, and I was just letting my mind roll. And I was interested in watching this, but I suddenly I've got to go to the bathroom. So I get up, and I'm a little, you know, I'm walking as like I'm pretty drunk. Mm -hmm. But I get to my get to my bath my room, which is fairly close. Now these rooms, no air conditioning, no fan, a very tiny commode. I mean, it's like a kid's toilet. And my big ass is like covers the whole thing and. Fat chance of getting your dick in the, in the toilet <laughs> at the same time. That ain't happening, right? Yeah, choose. One I feel or the like other. I'm in an elementary school. One or you know? the other. You, yeah. pick, you pick brown or yellow, and <laughs> right. that's and you got to stick with it. Exactly. So, so and and, and and there's no hot water, by the way, for shower. That's out of <laughs> no, the question. No. You recall that. So anyway, so I get to the bathroom in time, do my business. I'm I am really happy that that didn't happen in the room, right? So mm -hmm. I get back in there. I sit down. Now it's about 11:30, and I'm I'm really feeling pretty nauseous and. And then some, uh, then there's some crying starts on the other side of the room. So I mean, some serious, deep, sobbing. deep soul, sobbing. Soul I mean, sobbing. just ripping down crying, you know? Yeah. And I'm mean, going, fuck, that's really crazy. <laughs> you know, I don't know what's happening over there, but that's, that's, that's some ugly intense. shit. Yeah. But there was three girls sitting together. So I figured one of them was having some childhood or whatever issues sure. is going on. So anyway, about 11.30, and, uh, and I was so tired of sitting in a chair, I kind of laid down. And then I just blew. I mean, I had the bowl there, and I'm just like, I was like yelling into the bowl, you know. Uh -huh. So about then you're trying to spit this nastiness out of your throat and you wipe your face and stuff like that. And so finally I'm completely done. And I'm, I'm, I sit back up in the chair. <sighs> Moment of peace. Oh my God, really, I'm no longer the, the one that everybody's waiting for. I'm in the group, right? So, so all of a sudden after I purge, the ayahuasca really started getting me. So I'm going like, oh, my God, this is crazy. So things were like, all of my thoughts were really, really super animated. When I saw my family, they were extremely fancily dressed. I mean, hair done up. They're walking down streets that were made of marble. Uh, pillars were all gilded gold. And I mean, it was amazing. And because I was having thoughts of my family, but everything was decorated more than even Walt Disney could afford to do it. It was, mm -hmm. it was amazing. And I was just kind of, you know, I, mean, I, I don't... I don't, you know, I smoked hash when I was in the military, but I, I don't do any kind of hallucinogens, never have done any of that yeah. stuff, you know. So um, so I'm just paying attention to this stuff, feeling pretty nauseous, and all of a sudden, here goes my stomach again. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and if I can, I'm going to backtrack for a quick second, add this. When I was a kid, I didn't know it until after this all happened. When I was a kid, one of my nightmares that I had frequently was I was always at school carrying my books down the hallway with all the kids and I was in my dirty underwear or I had no underwear on or sometimes I was on the bus in my jock strap sweaty dirty going home and all the girls were laughing at me I just had this thing about being in my underwear it was my nightmare and and even <laughs> even to this day you know I've never farted in front of my wife mm -hmm. I just don't and I've been with her for 32 years I just don't do that mm -hmm. right and and when I go to the bathroom I go off by myself I don't get all public about things you know and so anyway so that's kind of me fecally right so I I'm, I'm a little twisted with that you know shut off with that and so now I'm I'm sitting there and I'm really feeling the ayahuasca get me you know and I'm thinking like, oh, fuck, man, this is crazy. It wasn't scary. It was just getting really involved, you know. And so here goes my stomach again. It goes, it's like, it's like a creaking door open slowly. And I'm going like, oh, my God. And so what I didn't know is there's a, there's a thing where when you have to go to your room and you need help, you're supposed to say, baño. 
Yeah. And there are people that help you. They come over with a little light. They get you behind the elbow, and they help you get to your room. Because at this stage, you're pretty screwed up you're for drunk. walking. Right? Yeah. You're drunk. Really drunk. So I didn't know you're supposed to say Vanyo. I wasn't there for that part of the, uh, uh, the preparation. So I just knew I needed to go. So I stood up, and I know i got to get out of that room, and it's pitch black. But I can kind of remember how to get to my room. So, so I, but I remember there was this big pillar in front of me. When I started to move my legs, they didn't work. They did not work. I went to move my leg and my right arm, my left arm went. <laughs> Honestly, nothing, you know, I, my brain was detached. And I fell and I grabbed this pillar and I got big strong arms so there's no way I was gonna hit the ground. And so then I grab my pant legs and I pull my legs up <laughs> under me and say, so okay, I got it. Now, meanwhile, I got about a thousand pounds of pressure on my ass keeping this flood back, right? Mm -hmm. And so I know I got to keep going, keep going. So and the man who spent his life largely in control of everything I was has not, now lost control of his legs. And let me tell you, <laughs> for the next hour, I can't imagine there I could possibly have less control. <laughs> I had no control. I was, so anyway, so I, I, I go, I finally get myself balanced. I let go and I start to take a step. I, what I didn't know until the next day, I actually fell backwards. And one of the shamans that was there reached up and caught me in the back, put two Probably hands Don up. Probably Don Robert's son. Yeah, his son. He catches me and I thought I was walking. I wasn't, I was falling. So he puts me back up and I get to the door. And I mean, I am really bad. I get outside of the door and everything has a, a rail. These are these big pillar log rails and I couldn't move my legs, so I'm grabbing the rail. And I'm like, I'm going down this. Now, on a good walk without being screwed up, I'm about 20 seconds max, maybe 30 from my room on a, on a, on a normal yeah. walk. Well, I'm, I'm holding on to the railing like um, I'm doing like a, a tug of war. I'm, I have the rail and I'm pulling myself along because my legs didn't work. Honestly, they didn't. It wasn't like you looked down. I'd look down at my legs and say, okay, left leg move. It didn't. My elbow would move. I was completely screwed up. So what happened is now I'm 20 minutes into trying to get to my room. I'm only 40 feet from where I started, right? My stomach is now on red alert. It is like <laughs> screaming, right? But I couldn't move. And so, and I'm sweating because, you know, it's the jungle, right? I'm 320 pounds. I know how to sweat. The jungle is a big assistant in, in getting me going, right? So I'm pure sweat. And um, so finally I've got this rail. I can see my room. All of a sudden I go, Bleh my ass let go. I uh -oh. shit myself right where I was. I am on the rail. And look, I couldn't move my legs. And I'm thinking like, this is my nightmare. I've never done this. I don't even think I shit my pants when I was a one year old. You know, I just didn't do that stuff, right? I didn't even shit in diapers. No, no, I, I, I was I born crawl on the to toilet. The, I would crawl to the toilet before I could walk. Exactly. I, you never saw me with shit on me, not even in my diaper, right? So now I'm on this fence, you know, and I'm pulling myself along and I couldn't kind of get the rail, so I had to reach under and get the vertical part of the rail and pull myself along those. I'm inchworming myself. And meanwhile, I got shit all over my pants and in my leg, right? But I can feel that it's stuck behind my knee, so I kept my, I kept my leg pulled up tight to keep it from getting out. And so I'm trying to move along, and here comes one of the guys, and I didn't know anybody, right? I just got there. He walks by, and he looks down, and he goes, Dude, you okay? I said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No problem, man. I yeah, got it. Got it. Yeah, yeah. I'm just kind of hanging out I'm on the rail here. I'm fucking good here, bro. Yeah, what do yeah you I'm mean? good. Just <laughs> leave me alone. I'm just hanging out on the rail, you know? Me, the big dumbass, right? No control. So finally, I see the corner, and my room is like 15 feet away. I said, oh, come on. There's the door. The door. I got it. So, but my legs didn't work. So what I did is I grabbed the, the corner post right at the 90-degree turn, and I threw my hip because I knew my leg had to go with my hip, right? So I threw my hip and swing my leg around so I can make the turn while I'm holding onto the pole. So when I did, when I dropped my leg and threw it, all the shit came out of my pants, <laughs> across the floor, and up the wall. This is in the walkway. And I'm dying because the people in, this, the, people in the room are about ready to be done, right? And they go to their rooms, because that's what you do after the ceremony, you know? And so I'm on this, I'm on the rail, shitting everywhere, and here comes everybody, right? So, I finally inch myself along to the room. I get in the doorway, and I can see there was a little light on, so I could see in the room, but I'm thinking, okay, how do I get to the bathroom? Because I honestly couldn't walk. And so I let go, and I just started throwing my feet, as far my legs as far as I could. To and halfway in there, I shit again, right? <laughs> and I'm trying to get my pants down. I, and the, the, bath, the, sh the stall is about as wide as my ass, these bathrooms, right? So I turn around, I'm getting my, and I, my arms didn't work, so I couldn't get my pants down. So as I'm getting my pants down, 
they're halfway, they're around my knees, right? And so I'm, <laughs> I hold the wall so I don't break the toilet, because I've done that before. <laughs> so I'm easing myself back, and there I go again. I shit again. <laughs> I shit across the top of the seat, and it was a small toilet. I sat, my balls were in my shit. I'm sitting here with my pants around my ankles, and I'm looking down at my pants. They're all shit on, I got shit everywhere. And my wife is coming. The one person I would shoot myself before I'd ever do this and get caught in, right? So, so ca here I'm in this fecal mess. I, I push my, the, my pants off my ankles, I shove them through the shit into the corner, and I can't get up. Okay, so my wife shows up. I pull myself up using the door jam, and I said to my Kathy walks in. I first thing I said is, "I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> don't go in that room. I will clean it. Please don't go in there. I'm sorry, because she thought I threw up. Yeah, right. Because you're not supposed to turn lights on, right? Sure, sure. So anyway, so I'm headed for the shower. I said, "Sweetheart, I, I got to take a shower." I said, "Where's the shower?" She goes, "Steve, it's right around the corner. Right around the corner. Just go out there, and it's right yeah. around there." I said, "Okay." And she says to me, but be careful when you go out in the hallway because I think somebody vomited in the hallway. <laughs> what I didn't know is my wife walked through my shit coming back to the room. She just didn't have a light to see what it was. <laughs> as soon as I turned the corner out the door. So anyway, I have to traipse through my own crap to get to the shower, right? Now I'm in the shower. It's really close there. I'm standing oh. in the shower. I got all my clothes off and I just let the water run. <laughs> 30 minutes later, Kathy comes walking in. She opens up the door. She goes, Steve, what are you doing? And you know me, you can't yeah. tell me what to do, like if I'm drunk. Yeah. I said, I'm fine, I'm cool, leave me alone, <laughs> leave me alone, I'll be fine. Yeah. And so she's, and Kathy knows, she goes, okay, you're on your own. Uh, yeah. So she leaves, and so finally I get all rinsed off, and I just have a towel with me. So I wrap the towel around me, I'm thinking like, okay, I'm gonna get to my room, I gotta clean that shit, and I gotta go to bed. <laughs> So I come out of the shower and I turn, but I missed my turn to the room. I didn't see it, so I, I went too far, right? I end up back in the ceremonial room, right? And here, I, and there was some other weird guy. You know, everybody, every yeah. class has kind of a creepy, kind of an attention whore kind of a person. Yeah. Well, the guy stayed in there, right? But it's pitch black. And I was looking, I, I find myself in the ceremonial room again, and I turned around and I hit the post with my, with my crazy bone and I dropped my towel because it shocked my arm, right? So now I'm standing in the middle, it, I'm standing there naked in the middle of the ceremonial room, right? And so I couldn't get out of the room because I couldn't find the door. So then I sat down in somebody's nicely prepared chair, they put their own stuff on it, made it really cool, but I had to sit down, I was about to fall. So I sit down in somebody else's chair, and I'm sitting there like, oh my God, this is horrible, this is horrible. How do I get out? So, so then I lean back, I shit again in this guy's chair. <laughs> so, again, and I'm like mortified. Honestly, if, if I'd have had a gun, I would have smoked myself for sure. This is horrible. I had no control of my body, no control of my mind. My wife had witnessed me doing the most the fecally terrible disaster of the century. And she is now in my room trying to clean my shit. You know, being a helpful yeah. wife, right? Um, so anyway, I, I, it took me another 45 minutes to get to the room. I was walking <laughs> naked. This one guy from Nigeria, his name is Dio. Dio goes by and he goes, hey, you okay? Yeah, yeah, no problem, man. Cool, you know, I'm, I'm fine. Don't help me. I'm wandering aimlessly, not wandering, I'm hugging the poles again. Now, you, know, you can get a picture of the 320 pound ass, this, this big old beef on, you know, I'm straddling a pole, I'm probably smelling fairly nasty. Yeah. Fortunately, it was dark, so they couldn't witness any of this. So I finally end up back in my room. I go inside, my incredible wife did the nasty deed of cleaning up after me, and she was dry heaving, right? <laughs> Because, look, it's bad enough you clean your own, you can live through yeah. that. Somebody else's is probably going to kill you, right? <laughs> so anyway, so I get to the, I just told her, I said, sweetheart, I'm so sorry. I've got to get to the bed. I said, grab, throw me some underwear because I couldn't get to my clothes. So she's finds some boxers. I put them on my ankles, but I got them tied up around my toes and I couldn't get them on because I couldn't move anything. And then I felt, I had a mosquito net put over my bed because I hate mosquitoes yeah, and they yeah, love yeah. me, right? Sure. So I start to go into the bed and I, tr I tried to move it, but my arms didn't work, so I fell into the mosquito net. So now I'm entangled like this big fish in a fish net in my mosquito net and my underwear tied up around my ankles. 
<laughs> so finally I'm like, fuck it. This is where I'm sleeping. This is it. I'm on the bed. This is good enough for me. So then, so then Kathy turns the light out and, and uh, she says, uh, Steve, where's, where's the bed? See, what I forgot about is my wife's messed up too. She's on her own thing yeah. and trying to deal with my stuff at the same time. And I said, let me, hang on, let me help you. I, I sat up and I said, oh, fuck, I can't help you. I'm sorry. <laughs> so anyway, she found her way to the bed. Yeah. That was around one. I laid in bed mortified at what I had done. About 5.30, I was able to crawl out of bed, still not as bad, but still almost like uh, fall down drunk now. But I was able to, then I was out there on my hands and knees naked because I couldn't get my underwear up. They're still wrapped around my ankles, cleaning my own crap and stuffing it in a plastic bag because I just couldn't live with the thought that somebody would walk by my stuff or walk through it. So I did clean it and uh, got, had a shower again yeah. and then got back in bed. That it was it was horrible, <laughs> honestly horrible. So I had I had emailed Don Howard the day after that, and I said, Don Howard, how's everything going? You know, how's my mother? How's Steve? And he just replies, Well, your mother's doing great, and Steve had some deep work, and he's on the path. <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you, <laughs> that's that's all he had to say about that. So when you came back and told that story first, holy shit, that puts you right in. You know, ayahuasca is famous for making you confront your deepest yeah. fears, one way or another. It's going to push you to the point. It'll get to that thing yeah. at the very end of the line that you're most afraid of and and make you do it and it can happen in real life it can happen in vision however it makes it happen and it fucking sure lived up to its reputation there i'm, t I'm telling you i i i didn't have i didn't understand that i had i didn't remember those dreams those nightmares i had as a kid until about a day and a half later by talking to the other people then it dawned on me because i didn't understand how to trace things back. What did it all mean? I've never done that because I don't live life in the rear view mirror. I never look back. I press ahead. Mm -hmm. That's where I've always been. And so once I really, and look, being at this place, as you know, <clears throat> one thing you're going to learn is how to relax, read, hang out in the hammock, you know, and think of life and get to a point of, because I'm always go, go, go. Well, there's nothing to do there. You don't go to the show. There's no TV. Yeah. There's nothing to do. So you learn how to slow down. I'm a very driven person. There's nothing to drive for in the Amazon. And then you had. Then I had to learn how. The I had to understand the the jungle, the plants, and and really start to get into that. Then it all mm -hmm. made sense. What I saw is 16 people drank the same thing in the same ceremony and had 16 dramatically different experiences, and it had to do with their life and what they needed. And what I come to understand is Mother Ayahuasca, Mother, because there's with the earth, there's always the female, mm -hmm. um, um, you know, that spirit. goes with it, the yep. spirit that goes with it. Mother Ayahuasca is going to give you exactly what you need. It's not a truth serum. You're not going to go there and say to somebody, oh, gee, forgive me because I fucked around on you, you know, four years ago. This is not, this is not what any of this is about. Transcends those stories. It's so far beyond. That is so lightweight tall. This is really getting to the the fundamental issue of you and you will find an answer and it is going to be good for you it's painful but it's good for you so what are some of the things that you know you've had some <clears throat> you've had you had some other experiences there too a couple that i'll you know try and get you to tell a little bit about but but what is it about that experience that you've been able to bring back you know because some people be like, that sounds horrible why would i ever do that but you know the people who go through it know the deep value that comes from it well you know? i you know what i learned and um Everybody kept saying while you're there, oh, these, you'll be profoundly changed forever. I'm thinking like, yeah, okay, that's bullshit. I mean, because how do you change? I mean, really, how do you experience something in a series of days and have dramatic changes? It doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but it's absolutely true. You know, I've, I've spent most of my adult life controlling everything. I controlled everything as a kid because of my family issues. And I don't mean to impugn my family. Great family, kind of blue collars, and you heard that story. But um, I've controlled everything all of my life, even in business, everything I've done. I'm a workaholic. Um, but what I found what I was, that I was doing is I was controlling people that didn't need to be controlled. I didn't really control anybody. All I did was stop people from being creative and doing what I hired them to do. Because I, I got so controlling that, uh, uh, and you know this, you've been around me long enough. Mm -hmm. Orlando knows this. People have been around me. Mm -hmm. I control. Well, you have to control as a cop. You have to control circumstances. I just never left that mentality behind. And so I've understood that I don't control anything. 
nothing. I couldn't even control my bowels, right? <laughs> I couldn't control my legs and, and, and my thoughts. Nothing was controlled. And I really always thought I'm a badass. You know, pit me against most guys. If you try to fight me, I'm, I'm probably going to win most cases, right? What I found is there are no tough guys. There's always somebody tougher. And what, what is the need to be so fucking tough in life? It was my own thing, my own insecurities that were bringing me to believe that I had to be this impenetrable, really big, powerful badass. And it was a facade that I was trying to show others because I didn't even know if I was there. Yeah. Um, it's the strength of invulnerability. Yeah. You know, toughness is protecting something right. because it's vulnerable. Sure. Well, when you're no longer tough, but just strong and feeling invulnerable because there's nothing you're protecting. Yeah. That's a different type of strength. Yeah. Well, gaining the strength to know that you don't need to be strong. You don't need to p give this facade of this mm -hmm. impenetrable badass. You don't need to control people. You need to learn how to give people the freedom to do what they do. You know, it's kind of like being on a stagecoach. I'm not the horses. I'm not holding the reins. Maybe I'm riding shotgun as a company owner. All I have to do is point out, go here or go there, when I see things going wrong. And I don't, I don't think as a coincidence that while I was gone, our sales increased by 25%. Yeah. Did I leave my people alone? Did I let them work? Yeah, I probably did. So believe me, I don't control my company now. I do my job, uh, and people are happier than hell. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's an, it's an ama more amazing for me just to give up. And, and it's not giving up in the sense of losing. Give up what I don't need to even have. Yep. I, I don't need to control everything. That just kills you. It just makes you old. And then you die pissed off, you mm -hmm. know. And what you don't want to do is die and people are happy that you're dead. You know, yeah, they cry. You're dead. You're all those things. But. You know, you get over it. What, I, what I've always hated in life is, you know, you, somebody dies, you bury them. A couple weeks later, nobody's crying anymore. You move on. That's kind of fucked, right? So why don't you make people happy while you're alive? And it doesn't mean this is for old people because I'm not old. I got another 30 years in me. Mm -hmm. But um, I just wish I'd have learned this lesson 30 years ago. Uh, what would it, what, how would it have affected me now? Dramatically. You know, the people that were there, I was the old guy there, right? There was a guy there 27 years old. It helped him dramatically. I wish I could have done it at 27. It, it's, it's a phenomenal experience. Yeah. Some people didn't get it because they resisted it. Mm -hmm. They really didn't let go. They're going to have to go back again. Yep. They are changed so, positively, but they're going to have either, to go back. You either, t you either learn the lessons in the, in the work or mm -hmm. life forces you to learn the lessons mm -hmm. you know, outside. And so one way or another, you know, you're going to learn or you're going to you know, die and have to come back and le yeah. <laughs> learn it again in another way. Yeah, because the ass weapons of life, I don't know how many of them people want. But you'll get ass weapons all your life long, and oftentimes they're self-inflicted. Yeah, so you, you know, you'll be asked to, to meet the challenge. And you either go out and seek those challenges mm -hmm. by doing something like ayahuasca and say, all right, bring it. Or it's just going to happen to you in, your, in real life, which is going to force you to do it. One way or another, there's no avoiding the ass whooping. Yeah, you know, you know I wish that there was, there's a lot of people that, you know, we hear about our ayahuasca, but there's a lot of, it's been commercialized in many places mm -hmm. and stuff, and it's not the right experience. And I don't know, um, I wish Don Howard was 40 years younger, and so does he. Yeah. Uh, and I wish that more people could go at one time, um, because a lot of people, everybody I know needs to go. Yeah. I'm telling you, it's such a great experience. Everyone I know should go, yeah. and everyone they know should go. So um, it's a great opportunity. Would I do it again? All day long. Yeah. The day before I went, that I want to go? No. The day that I was crawling down this, the, the stairs and holding on to the guardrails and shitting everywhere, did I want to be there? No. I thought it was the biggest mistake of my life. The greatest treasures come very hard fought and hard won. I've know? never learned a lesson and enjoyed the process. Yeah. Honestly, the things that meant the most to me, they were never fun, ever. Yeah, yeah. So you had, a, you had one story, I, I think, from the Wachuma, because you stayed for the Wachuma. Yeah. One story about the, the Jaguars, the vision of the Jaguars, I think was really awesome. Yeah, that was, that was pretty crazy. You know, I was, there was a tapestry that hangs up above the, uh, the ceremonial altar, and, and it's of a Jaguar's face. It's very large, and then wrapped around its face is the uh, anaconda, and the anaconda's head comes back and it and it parallels the head of the panther or the uh, the uh, jaguar and so it's one head over the other both eyes looking at you then the snake's body comes down and it's actually woven through the jaws 
of the of the uh, Jaguar. It's really kind of a cool, cool look. But I was on the I was uh, we were doing the uh, Wachuma ceremony, and you stand around in a circle and you stand around for long periods of time, um, and so. This, the, I started looking at that. I, everybody, a lot of people were just fixating on things that were on the table. I mean, there were skulls on there. There, there were j- jaguar skulls. There's all kinds of things. And sure. It's not a creepy thing, but it's really a cool layout that they yeah. have to, to inspire thought in, in people, you know. And so I kept looking at the tapestry. I couldn't look at the table because I was drawn to the tapestry and, and looking into the eyes of the jaguar and the, and the, and the anaconda. So... Suddenly, I, I I felt like when somebody slides their their arm over your shoulder, like when you're trying to date a girl and you mm-hmm. sneak the arm over. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I feel this thing on my shoulder. And I look and it's a snake going across my shoulder, and it's a long one because it was moving around to the next person. Kathy, my wife, was next to me, and I looked back and it didn't startle me, but the snake was pretty comfortable going across our shoulders. And um, and then I looked. Then I felt the side of my leg, like when a cat or a pet, your dog rubs on you. I looked down, and that was a jaguar rubbing my leg. And I looked down. And I thought, Wow, that is really crazy. And so then I was looking at the tapestry, looking down, and then the jaguar jumped up on my shoulders. And it, you know, you can feel its claws, but it wasn't locking into you. Uh-huh. And it just sat on my shoulders, kind of draped around my shoulders, just kind of viewing what we were doing, like part of the ceremony, but really relaxed. And, and then I kept watching the tapestry, and, and it's, it's kind of like I wasn't in this state that I couldn't get out of, but I wouldn't let my mind interfere with this. I had mm-hmm. to let what ha- was happening let happen, happen yeah. because I was fully aware of everything in the room. But then I looked down, and there's like uh, five jaguars. They're moving around everybody, going in and out of their legs, and the snake was pretty active on people. They were part of this deal. And so finally my mind changes to I was in this jungle setting, which I was actually in, and I'm laying down, and I'm laying, lying down with the with the jaguars. There's five or six of them, and it was like late at night, and it's where you would imagine everybody goes to sleep. All the jaguars go to sleep together in the in the jungle, and I was with them, and I was just lying there. And there was a big anaconda fairly close too, just kind of looking around. And um, and one of the jaguars was on my leg, and I could tell the jaguars were really hungry, and I could sense their hunger, and they hadn't caught anything in days apparently. And um, I'm sitting there thinking like you know, they should eat me because I know if they eat me, I'll live through them anyway. It was really a crazy thought. And so no sooner did I have the thought and really kind of relax or succumb to the thought than one of them started licking my leg and it bit into my leg and I was totally cool with them eating me. So as one started to eat my calf, another one came up and started to eat my thigh and one was on my back and they just started eating me. It was, I didn't feel the pain, but I could see what they were doing. I was completely fine with it. And then I actually started breathing much deeper, in which it was when I was looking at the tapestry, I was breathing really deep because I wanted to oxygenate my blood. If they're going to eat me, I want them to have really good oxygen in the blood, you know. And so they continued to eat me. And this, and this, this whole thing was, I'm about 15 minutes into this, standing there. And um, so suddenly I, was, I didn't see myself die, but the anaconda comes over, and it starts to go over my head. You know, snakes, when they swallow you whole, it started to move over my head, but I could actually see through its skin as it was going over me. And, and no sooner did it get over my head and start over my chest that I was no longer me in that, in that body. I was actually seen through all of the jaguars. And, and uh, so I was in all of them. It was like my DNA or like I had my spirit or something had gone into all these animals because I could see through all of their eyes. And it was the coolest sensation because it never bothered me. Yeah. And see, I've always had a thing with animals and like with dogs and stuff like that. I don't like them. I don't hate them. I'm good with animals. I'm not, a, I don't, I'm not an abuser in, mm-hmm. in any way. You know, I've had to shoot dogs like on, on police calls and stuff because they're, if they're vicious and try to get people. But I don't trust them because mm-hmm. from my childhood, I had some bad experiences as a little kid with dogs getting bit and stuff like that. And so I've always had kind of a fear of it and maybe something in that because this experience was totally cool and I didn't experience anything but submission and being part of the jungle and part of the animals. It was the coolest thing I've ever that's, done. You know, that's maybe some, some part of it on your personal side. But then you look back to 3,500 years ago in Chavin, and every one of their sacred sculptures is a human turning into a jaguar while taking Wachuma. So here, 3,500 years later, here you are down in the hut. No history of that. You don't know any of that. 
And there you are becoming a Jaguar with this same medicine followed by one of the last medicine keepers on the planet, Don Howard, doing the same thing that these people were 3,500 years ago and becoming a Jaguar by literally allowing them to take your flesh into their body and seeing through their eyes. Yeah, the cra- and you know, you, and I've never studied this. I don't know Wachuma from <laughs> Ayahuasca from any of these things, a Chavin. I don't, and you know, it, it's always been crazy to me. It's, thinking uh, when back when the Maya was at the Mayans or the Aztecs that would that would do all these sacrifices Mm -hmm. but I understood the mentality they would get into sacrifice themselves and be perfectly happy to walk up there and lie down and be sacrificed for what they believed in while I certainly wouldn't do that I now understand the commitment that they had for what they wanted to do the interesting uh, part of that is understanding that we're all part of the earth we are our DNA is in everything we're uh, which, which was a great revelation for me because I don't believe that I'm going to go to some really cool place called heaven and you don't have to work and you got these cool wings and you fly around everywhere and you never have to eat and you're always slim and look good and you always get laid. That's craziness to me, you know. Uh, but I really understood the value of, of the earth and the plants and all that. Uh, it was an amazing experience. Uh, but it was work. Yeah. It was not a vacation. It's it all, was work. It's all work. Yeah, it was, it was a lot of work. So you don't, you don't necessarily have that afterlife belief system, but then you do the Vilka, and you see you went to a place where, in, in your words when you told the story last time, you went to the place where the dead people go. Yeah. yeah. Um, the Vilka you take on the one of the last, the last night, and it's with the Wachuma. Uh, and even on the Wachuma, it's, there was some cr- just some crazy experiences I had with, with my wife, and it was really wonderful. But the Vilka itself... Uh, when you and you snort it through these old 3,500 year old bones, um, and so when you snort it, you go right to your room and you lie down. And um, I, I instantly went into this full on crazy sweat. My body temperature seemed like it went up to, felt like it was 110, but I poured sweat. But I laid down and I just let my mind start doing whatever it does. And by by now, you can you can imagine I don't resist anything at this point. I mean, I'm into all of it, and so. I suddenly I was ascending up in the, but I was still underground in as far as what I could tell. I was ascending up this corridor that must have been like a hundred feet across, and um, th- everything was lined with like tree roots and water because we're underground and it's leaking into it. And as I was ascending, there was a group of of uh, people in a cutout on the side of this tunnel, and it was four black men and two black women. And I, as soon as I saw them, I was a little startled, and I slowed down my ascension, and they looked down, and they said, no, 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 you're home. Your family's here. Come on home. And then I relaxed, and I continued to ascend. And I got to this place where all the dead people lived, and it was kind of like the old ant farms when I was a kid, you know? Everything was colonized underneath, and they lived on what was in the earth, which the oils or the kerosenes, and they had lanterns and stuff. And um, so I was walking around, and I was looking for my mom, and I find I found her hiding behind a tree, and she couldn't. I couldn't get her to come out. So I finally I sat down, and so she could see that it was okay to sit down. She finally came out, and she wouldn't look at me and sat next to me, and I put my arm around her. It was really cool, but the sense I got from th- from that was the life that I knew her from when when I was a kid. She wasn't proud of the way she was as a mother. And so I have a lot of work to do to kind of free her up so she can continue in the life that she needs to live down there. It's the craziest stuff. You know me. Am yeah. I religious? Do I believe stuff? No. No, you just tell what you see. You tell it. But the experience was real, and it's all true. It's craziness. Yeah. Can't be experienced. You, you, you don't get it until you do it. And like I say, it's not a vacation. It's <laughs> no, work. No, and that's, and that's what all the shaman, shaman people say. They don't tell you about things. Religion tries to tell you, tries to tell you this is the way things are. You should believe me and pay me your 10% and whatever. Whatever the religions yeah. build into that shamanism and true spirituality just says, here you go. See for yourself. Yeah. And regardless, just like you turning into the Jaguars and you going to these places, everybody ends up on the same spot. Yeah. And that's how you know that it's truth, you know? Yeah, and... and, and just to kind of reiterate, you know, back when I, I didn't study anything, I don't know the terminologies, I don't know a shaman from, from a sheep shearer, you know, I don't know any of this stuff. But for me to experience these, the same things that have been experienced for hundreds or thousands of years, I thought was crazy. Even, you know, where, when you mentioned the, the, uh, the influence of the, um, of the jaguar in, in all of this, mm-hmm. I don't know any of that stuff, but it all happened to me. Yeah. 
uh, it was nuts. It was I mean, it, on, honestly anybody who, if you can do it, do it. But make sure you do it at the right place with the right people, um, because it's critical that it's it's ceremonial, uh, that you let down, that you give yourself to it. But it's an amazing time, amazing time. Well, Steve, this is one of not only the best podcasts I've ever done, but one of the favorite moments in my life. And um, I'm just fucking honored. It's, it's honored, good stuff. Honored that, uh, you know, we've got to share so much of our life together and, and looking forward more than ever to the life that we'll have together from, from here on out. It's going to be great forever. It will be. Yep. I love you, man. Thanks for having, you, having me. Yeah. I love yeah. you and you know that. Yeah. I love you too. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs> right.